why, why, why did you take such a cowardly route? Um, from the Boston Tea Party, and probably before until now, anonymity has been an important part of almost every powerful social movement. This is not a coincidence. The Zapatistas, whom I, I know Hedges has spoken highly of, uh, took great pains to legitimize the wearing of the balaclava. Closer to us, um, in terms of our national context, in Quebec, the student strike earlier this year, explains why many of us who are on probation or who have uh, vulnerability in our immigration status, who are taking much greater risks than middle class people who have secure jobs, opt to be anonymous. And I want to emphasize that a movement that only legitimizes transparency marginalizes the vulnerable, right? Marginalizes those who who are most at risk in the society. And I will not tell those who are more vulnerable than myself that their masks should be off, that their faces should be exposed so that th they will look good for the cameras, you know, so that my idea of strategy can be advanced. I, I consider that irresponsible. And the people for whom there is little risk to go in with their faces uncovered to participating in these movements, which as Hedges has emphasized, are often illegal. Uh, the, the people who face less risk can't win even what they want alone. A movement that only legitimizes transparency it can't even win what the middle class wants. And I want to say, this is no lunatic fringe we're talking about. Again, may, this is many of the people in this room and many people around the country. So we, the question always comes up, how will we be, we be accountable to each other? We have to be accountable to each other. We're in this movement. We know each other. The people in black blocks who are taking special risks have to be accountable to each other and also have to take very seriously the question of how others will feel about what they do. They're taking greater risks than, than anyone else. It's more important to them. Finally, about the question of agents provocateurs. I have known agent provocateurs personally. I have seen how they operate. It's not an abstract question. And I want to say the greatest risk and the greatest danger that they have posed to other people has not been when they were wearing masks. If any of you listened to Democracy Now! about the events in Austin recently, it's not when you're wearing a mask that you can do the most harm as much as you can help. Right? The Black Bloc has come about in a time when there is this increased surveillance. And the main way that this surveillance state represses us is through isolation and neutralization. Uh, you know, Isolating and neutralizing those who pose the most threat. Uh, masking is a response to this. It's a strategic response. And I, I don't think that, that the uh, arguments against it that are framed as strategic outweigh the, the benefits of a participatory movement. Finally, it may be, Mr. Hedges, that your face on the other side of the rifles of the police will persuade them not to shoot. But some of us, whether we mask or not, they don't hold back. If this was an issue that was based solely around masking, uh, I'm willing to concede many of these points, uh, given the intrusion of the security and surveillance state. The problem is that for me, with the black bloc, the masking comes with other tactics. Uh, and you talk about the vulnerable. Uh, if, you know, and there were weekends that I was in here with my small children, uh, if you are an elderly person, if you are disabled, uh, and you are joining a group that you think is nonviolent, and there becomes black bloc action uh, that provokes a, a response from the police or tear gas, you can't get away in the same way that, uh, you know, somebody who's alone and, 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 and young and able to sprint down a road can. Um, but I, I think the issue you raise is a legitimate one. And uh, when you look at the sophistication uh, that is now being employed, uh, you know, you, anybody who went to Zuccotti saw that platform up there and they were filming night and day. Uh, and uh, so I think on the issue of masking, I'm willing, 
to concede it. I, I, I just, for me, the problem is that the masking comes with other tactics that I think are counterproductive. The next question is to Brian. What is violence and nonviolence, and who gets to define them in the context of social movements? Thanks. Um, I want to emphasize that this is not an abstract question for Chris or for me. Uh, Chris is a war correspondent, as he's pointed out. Everywhere he looks, he sees ethnic cleansing, even if it's just a kid with a spray paint can. <laughs> I, am, uh, I, I am here coming from uh, my history of participating in social movements. Uh, that, is, that is what I draw on to speak about this. When I think of violence and nonviolence, I think about an afternoon in Quebec City in April of 2001, the protests against the free trade area of the Americas uh, summit. Um, the police, making no distinction between so-called violent and nonviolent protesters, filled the entire city center with tear gas. They were shooting uh, rubber bullets at us. Um, and in that situation, I would not, myself and the 50-some-year-old mother of two that I was there with, we would not have been able to breathe if it had not been for the people in black taking those tear, tear gas canisters and throwing them back. You know, They were the only people between us and hospitalization. And they were the only reason that we were able to stay there since the police wanted to clear us out in the same way that the occupations last fall were cleared out. Now, the next day, when the newspapers came out, the front page news, news read, violence erupted when black-clad protesters began hurling tear gas canisters at the police. <laughs> and this, says, th this shows to me how this discourse of violence works in, in our society. Violence is indistinguishable from code for legitimate, or illegitimate, sorry, illegitimate use of force. Now, that's why when the slumlords force your rent up, uh, that's not violence, but when you resist an eviction, that's violence. That's why dumping carcinogens into a river is not violence, but sabotaging the factory that does this is violence. That's why uh, putting 2.3 million people in prison in this country is not regarded as violent, but trying to de-arrest someone, trying to rescue them from the hands of the police is called violent. Defining as violent is a way to delegitimize people, to exclude them from the field of legitimate discourse, and to justify the use of force against them. Uh, it, it came up earlier tonight that in Egypt, um, Obama him, himself called this a nonviolent revolution when there was tremendous interchange of projectiles with the police, when they burned down, I'm told, 99 police stations, and the, the headquarters of the ruling party. I want to say that was nonviolent, that was deemed nonviolent because they won, because it was necessary after the fact, after they had won, to say that what they had done was legitimate. If we start out saying, we will be nonviolent, we're nonviolent, from the beginning, we cede that whole territory. We say, we will only do what is already recognized as legitimate in this society. Uh, and this, this equips people like you see police captain Margot Bennett in, uh, in her quotation after a Berkeley conflict to say, those students were being violent. They refused to unlink their arms. Now, I always hear this, this critique when, when, I, when I advance these, these, these points. I always hear the critique, but they want us to get violent because it's a, it's a battle they can win. I want to clarify this because it's imprecise. It's not that they want us to get violent. The best thing would be if we remained inactive or only involved in harmless pacifist action, staying inside the, uh, the, the free speech zones and, and refusing to defend ourselves. That would be ideal. But if we're going to do something specifically, they want us to pick battles that we can't win, right? They want us to escalate into, for example, clandestine armed struggle as uh, Derek Jensen, who I believe is Chris Hedge's friend, endorses. Now, it, it, and I want to say clandestine insurgency is absolutely the wrong direction. We can't win that kind of struggle. What they fear most is us collectively uh, employing a diversity of tactics and becoming collectively unrulable, becoming collectively impossible to control. And that looks, participating in that looks very different to, to all of us. Thank you. Well, having been in various conflicts around the globe, I can assure you that the 
security and surveillance state could care less about people throwing rocks or breaking windows, um, especially when you're dressed in Kevlar and you're carrying automatic weapons. Um, that becomes a mechanism which does not in any way seriously threaten in an existential way security forces. What it does is solidify those security forces or bond those security forces to a corrupt ruling elite. Uh, I covered the breakdown of East Germany. That was at least until the United States in the current era, the most, uh, had the most sophisticated system of internal security in the world, the Stasi state. And uh, you mentioned earlier the Iraq demonstrations. The problem was not the demonstrations. The problem is that, is that we were unable to sustain them. And the anti-war movement voluntarily gave them up in 2004 because it foolishly thought electing John Kerry, who was no less militaristic than George Bush, uh, was a good tactic. It was turned out to be a very stupid tactic. Um, the, uh, the, the, the protests in Poland, in, in East Germany, were ones that went on for months and months. And, orig and they originally in Leipzig, and I, I was there, were, were pulling just a handful, a few dozen people, maybe 100, 200 people, and then in September of 1989, suddenly 70,000 people were out into the streets. You never know what ignites a population. That's one of the mysteries of uprisings. And Eric Honecker, the dictator of East Germany, sent down an elite paratroop division to fire on the crowd. And when they got there, they wouldn't do it. And Honecker lasted, after 19 years in power, another week. Uh, the same was true in Prague. Uh, it doesn't always work. Um, there are uh, times when mass movements, 1979 in El Salvador, which I also covered, when they brought huge numbers of labor union student people in the street and the response of the uh, Salvadoran security forces was to set up machine guns on the roofs of buildings and carry out a massacre which triggered the insurrection. Uh, but we haven't yet seen that kind of violence. And I would remind you that in Egypt, they gunned down 800 people. Uh, and they also captured thousands of people and tortured them, disappeared them, tortured them to death. And anybody who has covered, uh, as I have, the, the military complex uh, understands the killing potential, which I see our mass media now celebrating with this uh, book, No Easy Day. Um, these, let's be clear, are death squads. Um, 60,000 special forces operations. And when empires crumble, and they crumble from within, which is what's happening, the forces of control on the outer reaches of empire migrate back to the center. And having spent two decades on the outer reaches of empire, I know their capacity for violence and murder. <coughs> We've already seen it in the drug war. A night raid in Oakland is no different from a night raid in Fallujah. Um, same, same outfits, same automatic weapons, command helicopters with searchlights, it's exactly the same. All of those forces are being brought back. And if you are to confront them through means other than nonviolence, then you're going to have to confront them at a level of violence that threatens them existentially. Okay, I want to finish making my... Uh, please keep the... Excuse me. All right, I want to finish making my earlier point. Um, okay. Please allow our speaker to speak. Thank you. Thanks. Um, we live in a time when people are getting increasingly desperate. And the question is not whether people are going to revolt. People are going to revolt. The question is what happens when they revolt. People are going to do things that are, you know, that today we, we see as illegitimate or as crazy. People are going to act out. That's the word for it. Now, 
when this happens, if there is no movement that they can participate in to act out against their conditions, they are going to act out in isolation. They are going to act out, they are going to join clandestine armed insurgencies, or they are going to be, you know, they are going to throw their lives away in a, in a way that is antisocial and unproductive. Um, the, the question is, how do we make a movement that can make the most of all of our despair and desperation? That, that can create a possibility when we, we are at our breaking point to push forward in a way that, that benefits all of us. Now, if we make the, the black bloc into a bugaboo and we say that all those who act out are monsters and are against the movement and are going to ruin it, then we create a situation in which these people can only act out autonomously in a, in a way that doesn't, doesn't contribute to what everybody else is trying to do. And I, I want to argue again that this cancer in black block, sorry, cancer in Occupy, thank you, cancer in Occupy line is doomed to separate the movement into those who are not able or willing to push it far enough for there to be social change and those who will be isolated like the weather underground, unable to, to bring about the change that they need. Do I have one more second? I, I, and the last thing I want to say is about these, these uh, tactics like rock throwing in Egypt, it's entirely hypothetical whether Mubarak could have been toppled without all of the struggle that people engaged in. Uh, as for the, the tactics that people engage in in the United States, um, the, somebody is going to bring up window smashing sooner or later, so I might as well be the one to do it. We have to understand these in context. In Oakland, perhaps the reason that people have engaged in property destruction now is that when Oscar Grant was murdered a few years ago there, the police officer who shot him execution style in the back of the head did not even receive charges until there were riots in downtown Oakland. These tactics are seen as being essential ways for people to defend themselves even in the existing situation and not only to, to transform the world into, into the place that we want to be. question is to Chris. Violence is sometimes associated with hyper-masculinity and machismo. How would you respond to these claims? Is non-violence any less hyper-masculine and why or why not? Well, violence, uh, let's talk about violence in terms of war. Violence is a hyper-masculine endeavor uh, because it is about crushing uh, capacity for empathy, uh, compassion, uh, nurturing. Uh, it's why in every conflict that I covered, um, can you there was allow the a fusion to speak? of pornography and violence, such as the war in Bosnia. Is there's a kind of explosion, because violence is about turning another person into an object that you destroy. <laughs> that objectification uh, is classically hyper-masculine, and uh, military cultures are hyper-masculine for a reason, uh, because it is an attempt to shut off feeling. Um, you raise the issue of, uh, you know, are, um, Ga is Gandhi, for example, because he has patriarchal tendencies, patriarchy and hyper-masculinity are not the same thing. Uh, as feminist writers like Mary Daly and Andrea Dworkin and others have pointed out, we live in a patriarchal society um, that comes with male domination. Uh, and in the case of this country, a, a fusion of essentially male domination and white supremacy. Um, and it is when you embrace that domination uh, that it's a, it, it's a kind of, it, it's an incremental step to uh, uh, to hypermasculinity, uh, and uh, you know, one of my um, or one of the sort of issues within wars that was always so disturbing was uh, the way uh, all of those sort of qualities, those abilities to reach out and connect with others, were essentially shut down through the hypermasculine. Uh, culture of violence and the, erotic, the, the way violence was eroticized. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, 
violence for me, and I, you know, I've written this, you know, that war is a drug. War is probably the most <coughs> powerful narcotic invented by humankind. And once you imbibe in that drug, it does what all drugs do. Uh, it severs you from human contact. And I speak to somebody who, like most war correspondents, leapt from war to war to war because I couldn't exist outside that circle. Uh, uh, but, but it's about annihilation. And finally, in the end, it's about self-annihilation. Uh, and I think you know, a lot of the great feminist writers have a lot to say about this. So yeah, hyper-masculinity for me uh, is something that is frightening. And, uh, and when you act as a group, when you surrender moral autonomy uh, to carry out in a crowd or a mob, uh, which is, of course, what police are. You, you destroy their identities uh, so that they become a mass. Uh, and uh, uh, and it, it, it makes it uh, extremely enticing and even thrilling um, to carry out acts that are destructive and I think ultimately self-destructive. So is the black bloc as a tactic hyper-masculine? Um, to say this, I... Uh, I, I think there's some problematic gendering going on here. Um, as far as whether the anarchist spaces that I've been in that have produced black blocks have been male dominated, often they have been. Uh, not as male dominated as many of the Occupy organizing spaces that I've been in, to, to speak honestly. Um, to such an extent that that's been a, a, a notorious criticism by some of my female and queer friends of trying to organize in Occupy. Um, but really, this is just an anecdotal question. You, know, you can decide that, uh, that what the black bloc does is violence and therefore it's masculine. That's, that's not my gender analysis. Um, I wanna, but what I want to emphasize here is that Hedges has not participated in a black bloc or in organizing for one. So really what's going on here is that the mask is a reflective surface onto which people outside of it can project their assumptions. Right? Um, that's all I want to say from my own perspective. I, I think that it's, it's in poor taste for white men to use privilege politics in pissing matches with each other, to try to accuse each other of, um, of hyper-masculinity or, or this or that. Instead, I'd like to foreground somebody else's voice here, uh, a woman who can't be here today because she is serving a year in prison in Toronto, accused of being the so-called leader of the black bloc at the protests against the G20, protest, uh, G20 summit in 2010. Her name is Kelly Rose Flugback, and she answered the same question uh, with, with these words. Patriarchal society in general is infected with a deeply disturbing hypermasculinity. Patriarchy and prejudice against people with disabilities are deeply connected, and both pressure people to believe their worth depends on whether their body is attractive, useful, normal, and non-threatening according to dominant standards. Many of the things that people vandalized during the G20 were symbols of patriarchy, like window advertisements with emaciated, underage-looking girls in hypersexualized poses. Being constantly bombarded with these unhealthy images is hurtful and violating to people of all genders. Global capitalism is also inextricably linked to kinds of violence and exploitation that disproportionately affect women and girls. So in that sense, any form of opposition to the G20, multinational corporations, or trade blocs is also an opposition to patriarchy. There are many documented cases of female workers in sweatshops being systematically raped because they protested their work conditions. And the colonial history and ongoing economic exploitation of the Congo is what has caused the civil strife and pandemic of gang rapes that Congolese women are suffering right now. If Chris Hedges wants to speak out about the prevalence of hyper-masculinized violence in the world, he should rail against governments and multinational corporations, not a scraggly bunch of protesters who oppose them. Now, I know that that is one of the things that Chris does, but we are here today because in practice, his rhetoric helps the state to marginalize, to invisibilize, and to imprison women like Kelly Rose Flugback.
Well, I can assure you the state doesn't give a damn about what I write. Um, and somehow the idea that they're using my writings as a, as a use to imprison people or marginalize them is absurd. Um, I'm as locked out of the mainstream uh, as the black bloc. Um, you know, I'm hardly a, a figure that the establishment uh, uses uh, to uh, credentialize themselves. Um, you know, on the issue of, of violence, on the issue of diversity of tactics, uh, if the black bloc want to carry out an action, uh, I actually think they have every right to do it. I'm not going to join them, uh, but I'm also not going to inform on them. My problem is that they make it impossible for those of us who want to build a nonviolent movement to carry out our action. And there has to be a place. Uh, there, there is a place in uh, insurgencies and uprisings for various movements. Uh, when I covered the war in El Salvador, you had groups uh, such as the Catholic Human Rights Group uh, that would document the killings by the death squads and yet studiously espouse nonviolence. And yet when I traveled with the FMLN rebels, uh, they would often give me carefully typewritten uh, testimonies by people who lived in combat zones who had suffered at the hands of Salvadoran security forces and they would ask me to deliver those typewritten testimonies to the Human Rights Office at the Catholic Church because they knew that congressmen and others who came down would be able to hear those testimonies. And what I'm asking for is diversity of tactics. What I'm asking for is that you respect nonviolence um, and you carry out actions that don't turn our nonviolent activities into your vision of what you think resistance should be. We have one last question before moving on to the audience questions. Uh, this question is to Brian. How do these individual issues relate to our greater visions of social change, how it comes about, and what we're trying to do? How can our tactics distinguish and free us from the institutions we oppose? And how can our tactics <coughs> embody the world we hope to create? Thank you very much. I want to explain why I, I am making an effort to critique this cancer in Occupy, there I got it this time, uh, line. You know, I, I want to emphasize why that's an issue. Chris and I are not that far apart ideologically. Um, the one place that we differ is how we respond to the appearance of more militant tactics. Now, I, I'm with Chris. There's a time and place for everything. I agree with him about that. But that's not what he claimed in the Cancer and Occupy piece. He said that the Black Bloc is a, a totally distinct social body that has its own agenda that is against all of you, even those of you who have participated in Black Blocs and that it has to be excised, like a, like a, like a medical abnormality. Abnorm abnormality? There we go. Um, this, this runs counter to my understanding of how social movements work. It, and it seems to me that we have a really different idea of how this works. Um, my theory, my, my impression from what I've seen is that in a situation in which most people don't feel entitled to use certain tactics, whether it is to do things that are illegal, or to defend themselves, or to, to mask their faces when they need to do that to protect themselves. In this situation, what always happens is that a few outliers try out a new tactic. And at first, it's extremely controversial. But if they do it long enough and seriously enough, and they always make the effort to explain themselves to others, eventually, if this tactic is of use, it can catch on. And it can be useful to other people. A good example of this is that, you know, Occupy Wall Street was not the first occupation in this country, right? If you go back to 2009, there was an occupation in the New School that at the time was, was controversial, did not take off, was regarded perhaps by many as antisocial or confusing, and that, you know, that sparked occupations on the West Coast. Uh, and through this, this long, slow process over years, the, the foundation was built upon which Occupy Wall Street could take place. Now, similarly, People in this country are, are now trying to legitimize 
the wave of tactics that can get us out of the Occupy impasse. If we call these people monsters, if we take every step that we can to delegitimize them, we will paralyze ourselves and the movement for the future. Rather, we should be explaining, we should be taking advantage of the ways that we're situated, and Hedges is situated better than I am for this purpose, to explain to others why people engage in these, in these actions, why they are deemed necessary, and to, to draw from them what is useful, what all of us can apply, whether or not we ever wear a black sweatshirt. It, this is the, the business that we have to be humbly setting about. Because as Chris said, violence isn't glorious. You know? But I also want to emphasize everything that is called violence is, is, is not bad, in fact. A lot of it is things that if we, if we can do them, we will be able to break the deadlock of a, oppression that holds us where we are. Um, and I, finally, I want to say, if you don't want those who participate in black blocks, if you don't want those who, uh, who are part of this, this movement to, to be able to make this case, to be able to try out new tactics and be able to legitimize them, uh, you will have to demonize us to succeed. You will have to do what you did in Cancer of Occupy. You will have to say things about us that just aren't true or representative. You will have to, to make us into monsters. And in fact, there's, there's too many of us in this movement for this to happen without, without this dialogue. Whether you want it or not, it's going to happen. And I'm not even sure that, that you want to set about this, this demonization. But to, to conclude, I want to say, what you, you said a second ago that what you say is useless to the police, I, I don't buy it because I saw your line word for word quoted by, by police, not attributing it, of course, but using exactly the same framework. Black Bloc is outside. Black Bloc is not legitimate protesters. Black Bloc is chaos bent hooligans. In, in newspaper coverage, building up to the RNC, the NATO protests, and elsewhere. So I feel like the fact that you, as somebody who agrees with many of the people here about the situation, the fact that you, um, that you handed this narrative to the police was actually extremely irresponsible and dangerous for lots of people. Well, the reason uh, I sued Obama over the NDAA is because I knew the first group they were going to go after was the Black Bloc. Um, and, and then they'll work their way up the ladder. Uh, they take, they pick off the marginal groups first. Uh, they've already done a pretty good job of decimating Muslim American activists, whether it's uh, Fahad Hashmi or Samuel Aryan or anyone else. Uh, and they use precisely the same tactics. Uh, in the case of Fahad Hashmi, and he was held here in New York in Guantanamo-like conditions, 23 hours a day in isolation, naked. They never turned off his uh, bulb his light bulb in his cell, uh, what were they were pro using to prosecute him with were tapes of talks that he'd given as a student activist when he was at Brooklyn College. Uh, you look closely at the Muslim American community and you can see where they're going and what they want to do. Uh, and, and the next group they'll go after, and you've already seen it uh, in the case was it in Cleveland where they got these, used an agent provocateur to get these kids supposedly to blow up a bridge uh, uh, and, and we saw it, as I mentioned earlier, in the NDAA case where they tried to demonize U.S. Day of <coughs> Uh They know what's coming. Uh, I, I agree with Brian that we are certainly headed for a period of deep instability and unrest, and the corporate state is working overtime to create the legal structure whereby any whisper of dissent becomes impossible. Uh, so... Uh, the, I, I'm not going to get into this Graeber argument as to whether what I write, you know, suddenly gives the uh, Homeland Security an idea of, you know, what they want to say. Um, I, I, maybe they are. Maybe they read everything I write. I hope they read everything I write, uh, but I kind of doubt it. Um, you know, the, the, the question really comes down to what's going to work. And I have yet to hear a coherent explanation on the part of Black Bloc Number one is the kind of vision that they have for the society that we want to create and how these tactics are going to get us there.
if we do not bring the mainstream over to our side, I don't think we can win. And I think what we have not raised is that this backlash could very well be hijacked by proto-fascist movements. Um, the Christian right, the Tea Party, and unlike us, they are going to be bankrolled by the most retrograde elements of American capitalism, the Koch brothers and others, just as the German industrialists bankroll the Nazi party. Political paralysis creates extremes, and the longer that paralysis continues, the more people walk away from the systems of power. And when these corporate interests feel threatened, um, they have the capacity to empower these proto-fascist organizations that celebrate the gun culture, that speak in the language of violence, and that do what all fascist movements do, which is to demonize the vulnerable. Muslims, undocumented workers, homosexuals, intellectuals, liberals, feminists, they have a very long list of people they hate. And fascism and violence run like a very dark, we are a very, very violent society. And I think that in times of instability, we cannot rule out that this backlash may be a populist right-wing backlash. And, and, and that has to be part of our consciousness when we begin to raise, uh, when we begin to raise the issue of effective resistance. Great. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, it seems to me that it isn't just bullets or tear gas canisters with which the government represses us. Above all, it's, uh, it's, they use the narrative. They frame the narrative. Now, I, I'm sure that you believe this in the same way that I do. Otherwise, you wouldn't have written that the Black Bloc was giving the government the excuse to repress us. That's a matter of narrative. Um, if we create this other narrative, uh, as, as I understand it, which you were trying to do, um, you can see how that would also be useful to the government, right? And you, you mentioned the thing in Cleveland. I really appreciate you mentioning those kids who have basically been entrapped there, but it's significant that those kids were called in, in the mainstream media. They were s described as black bloc anarchists, even though there's no evidence that any of them had participated in a black bloc. And that's because the, the narrative that came out of Cancer of Occupy and out of all of this invective was that whoever it is that is scary is the black bloc. Bomb makers are the black bloc. And this is very useful to the government because, well, let, what would it have taken for us to say in those occupations? Maybe feeling entitled to wear masks. Maybe feeling entitled to resist. Maybe feeling entitled not to be afraid of standing up for ourselves. And, their, their, the narrative that they're going for, their operation is to create an environment in which whenever average Americans, whoever that is, see people who are doing the things that it would take to maintain space, they, they will say, oh, those must be bombers, they must be terrorists, they must be like those people in Cleveland. Do you, do you all understand what I'm saying? This, this, is, this, is, this is absolutely what they're trying to do. So as far what our vision of change is, like I said, like I've said it throughout, using the same examples that I think Hedges endorses, our, our, our task is to expand the range of what people feel entitled to do. This, do this humbly, do this persistently, and, and not glorify anything, but just go about the, the, the business of trying to do this. We're going to be demonized, even by people that should be our allies as we do this. We're going to face all sorts of name calling and invective, but just to continue doing it, courageously, unstoppably. Thanks. Uh, I'd now like to invite both of our speakers to give a four-minute closing statement. So if we can start with Chris. Yeah, I mean, traditional anarchism I'm deeply sympathetic with. Uh, I, I come out of the... Christian anarchist movement, Dorothy Day, um, where you have a constant alienation from power. Uh, I think the issue is power. It doesn't really matter who holds it. Uh, when Karl Popper writes uh, uh, The uh, Open Society and Its Enemies, he says that the question of how we get good people to rule is the wrong question. 
Uh, most people, he says, who are attracted to power are at best mediocre, which is Obama, or venal, which is Romney or Bush. The question is, how do you get those in power to be frightened of you? Uh, and you do that by building movements. The anti-organizational element of the black bloc, uh, which is not something, by the way, that, that the great anarchist thinkers of the late 19th century and the early 20th century embraced, whether that was Bakunin or Kropotkin, Emma Goldman, Berkman. Uh, they all believed in the primacy of astute and intelligent organization and effective tactics. Uh, all of the correctives to American democracy came through movements, popular movements, that never achieved formal positions of power whether that was the Liberty Party that fought slavery, the suffragists who fought for women's rights, the labor movement, and finally the civil rights movement. And you could argue that until he was assassinated in April of 1968, the most powerful political figure in the United States was Martin Luther King. Because when he went to Memphis, 50,000 people went with him. And we have no hope left unless we rebuild those movements that were systematically destroyed. I spend a lot of time in Death of the Liberal Class talking about it, starting in World War I, in the name of anti-communism, and what Dwight MacDonald calls our psychosis of permanent war. And when the Soviet Union went down, the most uh, vile elements of the power elite needed something to take its place, and it became terrorism. War, as Randolph Bourne writes, is the health of a state, the ability to accrue themselves all sorts of power. And we are reaching a, a, a crisis moment as we decline, both as an empire and we watch the collapse of globalization and the rise of frightening reconfiguration of the ecosystem on the, for which we depend for, for existence. And if we don't rebuild those popular movements, uh, we will have nothing left by which we will protect both ourselves and finally the next generation from the devastation that's being visited upon us by our corporate overlords. Um, the great novel I've come uh, to believe of the American experience is Moby Dick. These figures are all Ahabs. When 40% of the Arctic sea ice melts, all they talk about is exploiting the last vestiges of oil, mineral, gas, and fish stock. It is collective suicide. As Ahab says in the book, my methods and my means are sane, my object is mad. And we have very, very little time left. And so the tactics we employ have to be smart because the forces arrayed against us are working overtime to crush us. I have no uh, fantastic, uh, inspiring closing statement. Um, I, I, I didn't prepare one. I don't usually, like I said, try to come on stages like this. Uh, I felt that this was necessary in this particular situation because somebody who has a lot of leverage and legitimacy was using it irresponsibly. And it's, it's hard for me to imagine that Kropotkin, Berkman, Goldman, and Bakunin would be sitting in the crowd here applauding as Hedges continues to hedge, I guess, and, um, and refuse to acknowledge and apologize the, the risk that he has put people at by, by spreading this narrative. Um, when I, I want to say also the, the idea that the black bloc is anti-organization, that the black bloc is something monolithic. Uh, I want to say there are many different forms of organization that people who have participated in black blocs adhere to. This is not a matter of anti-organization. This is perhaps a, a matter of competing ideas about what kind of organization is going to be most effective. This is not a refusal of strategy. These are different strategies. We want a decentralized horizontal movement, a movement that doesn't have to subscribe all to one tactic in order to be able to move forward. A movement that is diverse and can make the most of that diversity. We won't and we cannot impose one format on struggle. That, that involves too much surgery, too much removing cancers one after the other until you find that all your organs are gone. 
like I said, we have to make the most of our diversity. And, and as I understand it, Hedges has revised his earlier position in the things he said and said that the black bloc is part of the movement and that people just have to understand that there is a proper time and place for everything. Oh, okay, I also want to be part of a movement with people who are not always wearing black sweatshirts. I agree about this. Um, but please, next time you hear somebody from a position of tremendous power and influence saying, those poor people, those nobodies over there, they just want to destroy your movement, they're not part of it, think twice. You know, go talk to the nobodies. See, see what they have to say about this. Um, and, and finally, if any of the things that I have said make sense to you tonight, let's continue talking with each other, let's continue meeting and building up a powerful movement so that we can actually get out of the situation. Thank you so much, everyone. to move on to the question and answer portion. I have a lot of questions here, and I'm hoping we can get through as many as possible. So if I can ask the speakers to try and limit the responses to about one minute, if possible, to try and get through as many questions as possible. So the first question is for Chris. Um, can you explain what you meant when you called the Black Panther Party parasites? Do you still feel this is an accurate assessment of, and the American Indian movement? I don't remember ever calling them parasites. Next question. Oh, no, what, what, I, Excuse me. The is next there? Question. Is do you have an article where I call the black uh, black, black Panther I can, parasite? I, I don't remember. It's it, it's okay, everybody. I, I I'll cite the article that he's talking about. It's the um, yeah, I, I read it right. It's the one where you say uh, violent parasites or violent extremists attach themselves to all social movements like parasites. The the Black Panther Party the American Indian movement, and then you run through and you're the Symbian, Symbianese Liberation Army by the, by the end. Um, you say, I, I, as I understood it, that's what you were doing. I didn't write the question, but that, that was my impression. Right. H having read a fair bit of your material. I mean, the Black Panther Party and the American Indian movement are, are different movements from, let's say, the Weather Underground. Uh, the Weather Underground is sort of white, uh, privileged and nihilistic. Uh, the Black Panther Party and the American Indian Movement arise out of uh, significant repression and violence that have been committed against those uh, communities. And yet, uh, I would argue uh, that in the case of both AIM uh, and the Black Panther, uh, it went, uh, it, it gave to the state uh, a kind of uh, mechanism by which they could discredit uh, the broader anti-war and uh, civil rights movements. And that was, of course, always the tension uh, between Martin Luther King and the black power movement. King, at the end, by 1968, became a very lonely figure, uh, booed in Watts, uh, uh, and uh, there were huge defections from Stokely Carmichael and others, even within his own movement. Uh, but I think that that is my fear of violence, uh, that resorting to acts of violence uh, cripple and hurt uh, mass movements and give to the security state uh, the kind of publicity and no question that the security state blows whatever activities are done by these groups way out of proportion, but gives them a kind of publicity vehicle that they loop. I mean, go back and look at the 1968 revolution in France, which was carried out mostly by labor, 11 million people carrying out sit-down strikes, uh, and de Gaulle used a kind of fringe movement that was violent and, and then looped it constantly on television to justify the excesses of the state itself. The next question is for Brian. Would you say violence is entirely a sociolinguistic construct, or would you accept the more common usage of the term as reflecting a material event that causes harm to or violates the integrity of the human body. Why or why not? Thanks, Tracy. Uh, thanks, Tracy. Um, can I have the card in front of me? To, I, I'm a little slow, thanks. Um, well, violence is, is a mix of all these different things, right? It's a, it's a, it's a discursive, I'm in a university, right? Is that, is that, am I using that right? It's a, a, 
It's like a, it's a matter of discourse, something like this, right? It means different things to different people, which is one of the reasons that I think it's really important that we don't say we're nonviolent and assume that that means the same thing to everyone. That if, especially if you want to identify as, as being nonviolent, if, if you think that's important, you have to be able to clarify exactly what that is and also protect people who don't use that language from the kind of delegitimization that the legitimization of nonviolence equips others to carry out against them. Does that, does that make sense? You all follow me? Okay, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. The next question is for Chris. <laughs> Can there be a coexistence of black bloc and nonviolent tactics? If yes, in what form and what situation? I think there has to be uh, a respect for diversity of tactics and the black bloc has to respect the tactics of nonviolent movements. Uh, I don't support uh, the vision of the black bloc or their tactics, uh, and yet at the same time, I'm certainly not going to do anything to impede uh, you know, having them carry out those tactics, and that's what I'm asking for, that they respect those divisions, uh, and if they respect those divisions and they call a black bloc action, uh, I, I, you know, I won't attend, uh, but I'm certainly not going to help the authorities do anything to crush them. The next question is for either um, Chris or Brian. Do you think occupying, in uh, quotation marks, is a form of liberal protest or a way of expropriating the means of existence from the privileged classes? Is it possible to do the latter without incurring the violence of the state? Well, we, we, the answer to that is no, of course, because the violence of the state was visited upon Occupy. Uh, mass movements uh, have a kind of power uh, because they resonate uh, with the mainstream. And this movement, uh, what was the Occupy movement, what we're seeing in Chicago, is different from the civil rights movement. Uh, King needed white liberals, which proved very fickle allies, uh, in the battle uh, for uh, racial justice. Uh, but as soon as uh, racial equality uh, was uh, advanced uh, and King attempted to advance economic justice, uh, his, the white liberals deserted him. And in many ways, the civil rights movement was a legal victory, but an economic failure. And King understood that without economic justice, there would finally never be racial justice, which is why the bottom two thirds of African Americans in this country are worse off than they were in the 60s when King was leading civil rights marches in the South. And um, the, uh, the issue of economic justice is one that I think Occupy picked up. Uh, and they picked it up because uh, there were large numbers of white, middle class, college educated kids who suddenly began to experience what people in marginal communities and people of color have been experiencing for several decades. Um, police repression is hardly anything new if you live in East New York, uh, but it was new uh, if you're a graduate of Oberlin College and working in a deli. Uh, and uh, my assaults against the liberal class are precisely that they retreated into a kind of boutique activism of multiculturalism, identity politics, inclusiveness, and forgot the primacy of justice for the working class and the poor. Uh, and if we are to succeed as a movement, um, we've got to recapture that the economic primacy of justice uh, in order to go forward. I'll just say something really quick about this. Is occupying a form of liberal protest or a way of expropriating the means of existence? Uh, that's the question I was trying to pose, however clumsily, at the beginning. Um, if we see what we're doing as an appeal, as an just a, a registering of dissent, it will not change the situation that we're in. If we, uh, if we approach it as a project of actually getting our hands on the resources that we need to remedy the, the imbalances in our society, uh, 
yes, we're more likely to come into conflict with the state. And it's telling that when we set out to expropriate the means of existence from the privileged classes, we barely feel entitled even to take over a public park. You know? this, this emphasizes again how important this project of becoming, uh, becoming more confident in ourselves, it, of trusting ourselves more, of feeling more entitled to, to act, you know? not, not feeling uh, like a public park is barely the most we are entitled to, but all of the riches that we have produced in this world. question is for Chris. What is different about the United States? You have embraced the Egyptian uprising where crowds physically fought police for access to and control over Tahrir Square, but renounced even verbal violence towards police in advising the Occupy movement. How can this be explained morally and practically? Well, first of all, you're pulling half a million people into Tahrir Square. Uh, that's number one. And number two, uh, the, the, the most uh, crucial moment in the Egyptian uprising uh, was when the army commanders realized that they could not call upon their soldiers to fire upon the crowd. Uh, and if you remember, there were pictures of occupiers in Tahrir Square climbing up on the tanks of the soldiers, which I think goes right back to proving my point. For me, the most effective strategy is not to confront the pillars of power, but to draw them towards us by fragmenting them. Uh, that. Uh, and that's why even verbal abuse to the police is a mistake. The police are working class. They come from working class communities. They work uh, at these financial centers earning $37 an hour uh, as rent -a cops They watch these guys walk by in their $8,000 suits uh, and they might as well be a piece of the furniture. And the, 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 the effectiveness... The effect, the, okay, please, please let the speaker continue. The effectiveness of the movement will come with creating internal vision, divisions within these structures of power, whether it's civil service, whether it's security forces, or anything else, and, and that creates internal systems of paralysis. That's, I'm, not, I'm not promising that you that it will work. I certainly am not in any way defending, in many cases, what the police do. I'm just talking about a tactic that I have seen work in Eastern Europe uh, and that, that is potentially effective and I think worth pursuing. Okay. Um, there's a question, I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to read it exactly, it's kind of crossed out a bit, but it might not make sense, but. Which are, which are fighting the state have massive support? <laughs> I was wondering, it doesn't make any sense. Um, why is it that the left as a whole doesn't, why is it that the American left as a whole doesn't even acknowledge these movements? And Chris Hedges, if a movement like this in the US were to Christ, would you support it? Arise, I'm sorry. arise. It says oh, arise. Oh, okay, sorry, it says arise. If a movement like this in the U.S. were to arise, would you support it? Which movement? Which we are fighting the state have massive support. I, I don't get it. Okay. Um, okay. The next question is for Brian. Has the black bloc ever been engaged in a protest that was successful? Did the Iraq war continue nonetheless? Did NAFTA pass? Did OWS have any victories if it can call its own in general? Well, I'm not sure how the person who framed that question defines success. My argument would be um, that success is, is a very complicated thing. You can't immediately gauge it. Um, if, if we frame success as preventing the government from doing something, that's it's difficult. We, we rarely succeed with any tactics from getting them not to pass a particular kind of legislation, but the black bloc is not a kind of hard lobbying. The black bloc is a way for people to uh, act together anonymously, to 
make the most use, as they see fit, of their own personal capabilities. And in that regard, every time people engage anonymously, collectively, in an activity that they wish to, that they otherwise could not, it is a success. It's a success for the participants in that it returns a little bit of autonomy and a little bit of power to, to those who, who engage in this. Um, now, of course, we have to look at these things strategically as well, as, as Hedges is, is arguing. Um, you could argue in theory that the black bloc that happened in Seattle in 1999 that was so famous was strategic and successful in that it galvanized young people all around the country to, to perk up and to become really excited about what was going on in the anti-globalization movement. I, I'll admit I was a punk rocker in the 1990s, and in 1998 it wasn't very easy to find another punk rocker who could tell you much about the World Trade Organization. By 2000, just about every punk rocker that I met could, could give you a long rundown on the IMF and World Bank and how they were implicated in oppressive policies throughout uh, the Global South. And this, this is because when you don't know what to do, when you can't imagine yourself taking any action, it's hard to become invested in the issue. It's hard to become invested in anything. You know, th this is why strategies that begin from education often have limits. But when you feel there is something you can do, however small, often you, you, you come to be really, uh, really focused on the issues and, to, and to, to learn about your agency and what you are capable of doing. In that regard, that black bloc and many others, I would, I would say, have been extremely successful in catalyzing the movements that we see around the United States now or else we wouldn't be having this conversation in the first place.